ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast, episode number 107. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today. And as usual, with me is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. And we are simply having a wonderful Christmas time. It is December here in the Malthouse Games household, which means Christmas time, holiday time for us. Uh, by the way, this is a podcast about board games, card games, role-playing games, tabletop games, dice games, RPGs, things of that sort. And beer. And beer. Our first beer on this uh, start off to the December month is from Iron Monk Brewing up in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This is their chocolate habanero stout. It says, I have to find it and like turn it toward the light and then see if my glasses will help me out. When this beer started out as a taproom rotator, Some people wouldn't even try it. Those that did fell in love with the combination of silky smooth, chocolatey deliciousness and the the back-of-the-throat habanero heat. We quickly decided to make this spicy stout available much more often. But that wasn't good enough for these adventurous folks. They demanded that we make it our first seasonal release, and being the good people we are, we obliged. This one's for those first hardcore taproom patrons. You know who you are. It's pretty cool that they did that. It is a 12-ounce can at 8.1% alcohol by volume. And it is delicious. I've already had a couple of these when I was doing my Freddie Mercury knockoff puzzle. My, uh, my sister, well, really my, my five year, four-year-old niece, gave me a puzzle of... It's, it's not supposed to be Freddie Mercury, but it totally is. There it's is supposed no, to be champion. There's no queen licensing on it. There's no Freddie Mercury estate licensing on it. It doesn't even say queen or Freddie Mercury on it. It's just a very, a very cartoonish Freddie Mercury lookalike with the word champion across the stars. And this beer, I can tell you, pairs perfectly with sitting on your butt on the floor and doing a Freddie Mercury knockoff puzzle. Yes, this beer is literally black as night. You can't see through it. There's no light getting through this beer. It's very, very dark. Uh, it holds a little bit of head. Has a very chocolatey smell. Mm. Very heavy smell. Very light, I would say, for a dark beer. It's light, it's sweet, and it has just a little tingle of pepper on the back of the tongue. It is a lot lighter than you expect it to be. It finishes fairly flat. But if you watch it, like watch it, Del. If you see it in the light, you see the bubbles popping up. It it looks like a twinkling stars. It's really cool. There's little bitty baby bubbles. Like it's just carbonated enough. It's so dark, but it's just carbonated enough. That there's just little bitty baby bubbles just making a pretty little night sky. Like, what's, what's around? Knock off Freddie Mercury. It's beautiful. It is surprisingly crisp. It is that chocolatey, that smooth, and it finishes. And then you just start to get a little heat at the back of your throat. Now, here's the thing. I am not a spicy beer, spicy drink, or spicy sweets fan. I don't like Mexican hot chocolate. I don't like chili chocolate. I don't like anything like that. So this beer to me is fine. If you like a spicy beer, this is a good beer. But it's not it's not my wheelhouse of drinks. But I don't feel like this is novelty. Now we do have no. a brewery here in Edmond called the Battered Boar and I love the Battered Boar. Uh, they have some really solid beers that are very drinkable, very good. But they do have one that is a Hatch Green Chili Beer. They only serve I think it's five ounce pours is what they serve. And it is very spicy. Very, very spicy. That one is almost to the point of novelty because you're not, that's one you don't really drink to enjoy. Like, I've drank it. I've had it. Probably not going to order it again unless I have some friends who are like, oh, I want to try that. But like, okay, well, I, I'll order it so you guys can try it. Well, to be fair, most of Battered Boar is pushing toward novelty. They, they, they go so strong with their flavors. All of their flavors to me are over the top, but that also makes them unique because they're also all done so well. They are. So I think that that's part of it, but I do understand what you're saying. But this one, like, you do have the little bit of habanero, but it is very drinkable. It's not like a, ooh, that's spicy. I'm going to give this as a gag gift. Like, no, this is a decent beer to sit and enjoy. And it pairs, pairs perfectly with a knockoff Freddie Mercury puzzle and a podcast. It is a very good beer if you like that style. I'm a stout fan, so... 
It ticks those boxes. It's just that little bit of that spiciness to it that I'm not a huge fan of, but I'm going to obviously put up with it for my six ounces of the can. But yeah, so welcome to the Malthouse Games podcast. That's the first beer of the episode. Uh, it, our last episode was the BGG one, I think. Yes, and it was right before it was right before my birthday. So I'm in a new decade, new me, y'all. Wait, are we 107 or are we? No, we are. We are 107. Episode 106 was BGG Con. I was like, wait, are we 108? Oh God, I can't keep up with our episode numbers at this point. Every time somebody asks me, I'm like, ah, I don't know. We're over a hundred, but we're less than 120. <laughs> we're not to the teens. So yes, 107. Jeez. But yeah, so the last episode was BGG. And since then, we've played several games in the house. We got to go play with our friends John and Laney, which we talked about on the BGG episode. And we of course had Haley's birthday. Yes, I turned 30. And Delton is the sweetest of the Deltons. Hello. First of all, he took me out to a wonderful breakfast at Red Cup. Second of all, he took me to a Christmas market. Third of all, he spent a very fruitless three hours trying to dress drop with me. It was definitely fruitless. So it turns out, I am the shape of SpongeBob SquarePants, living in a Bratz girl world. Every dress story went into it. It doesn't matter if it was a junior section or an adult woman section or if it was a boutique or a mall store, all of the dresses, if if I found one that fit me, because, again, I am shaped like SpongeBob SquarePants, do with that information what you will in your imagination, but if I found a dress that fit me, all I had to do was shrug slightly, and you could probably see the bottom of my butt. So that was a no-go, declined all the dresses, so got back home, put on a nice older dress, and Delty took me out to dinner on top of the Devon Tower. Yeah, down in Oklahoma City, we have the Devon Tower. It's an oil company, Devon Energy. They built the Devon Tower however many years ago now. It's the tallest building in Oklahoma. It goes up to 50 floors. It sticks out like a giant middle finger in Oklahoma because it is the tallest. <laughs> yeah. There's a few, like, tall buildings, but then you have the Devon Tower. It's just like, look at me. It towers over everything else. And uh, at the top, on the 49th and 50th floor, they have a restaurant called Vast. Uh, it's changed ownership several times throughout the years, but at its current state, it is, uh, as we found out, very good, and their vegan options are delicious. They're very accommodating, very good service, amazing view. Uh, you can go to our social media, at Malthouse Games, and see a picture I took of Haley and posted. You could see the, uh, I guess you could call it the skyline of Oklahoma City, but there's not much height there. It's kind of just a big flat. Still cool, though, from the top of Vast. Uh, so, yes, we got to go to a fancy dinner in a probably the fanciest place in Oklahoma City. Yes, and our server, so our server was very nice, very polite, very proper. Uh, you can tell that she was a, a professional at her job. Uh, mad respect to all servers, but she, you could tell that this was her craft. But at one point, I asked her, I said, hey, can I ask you a question? She says, of course, ma'am. And she, like, puts her hands behind her back and, like, leans down toward me. And I said, how many proposals do you guys get a year? And I have never seen somebody eye roll with their entire face. It was ridiculous. Awesome. She was like, oh, no, we get three or four a week. And then she pointed over to one of the mail servers and she says, that guy over there, he's cursed. He's had two say no. Yeah, and I couldn't imagine a proposal in a fancy restaurant, how that would go. That's just so awkward and, oh, boy, but yeah. Three to four proposals a week in this restaurant. So you're probably not getting free dessert there if they have that many a no. week. It's, it's not going to happen. Not at all. And she even made a point to say, like, they're a special occasion restaurant. People don't just go to lunch at that restaurant. I mean, that's the same thing. We only went because it was Haley's birthday and I wanted to take her somewhere nice. And they had vegan options that actually sounded good. It wasn't just, you know, a tomato and a can of beans on a plate. It was something good and they take the time and it's a scratch kitchen. So most anything can be made vegan or they could prep just kind of whatever with their ingredients so it was nice but yes so they get a lot of those proposals which is just that's crazy absolutely crazy but delton really treated me well for my birthday he got me mushroom grow kit uh he got me a willie nelson t-shirt books he got me cookbooks he got me books like he did so much for me so delty thank you so much for my 30th birthday you're welcome and uh new decade new me decade's been great so far about six uh i guess we're more i guess we're like what 12 days in at this point? 12 days of Christmas. It's great. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> 12 days of my birthday of my 30s. Yep. 
But yeah, so since then, you know, we had my birthday. We got back to the old grind of working an actual full work week for the first time in three weeks. And like Delton said, last night we went to John and Laney's. Yeah, we got to play some fun games because we talked about playing with John at BGGCon when he sat with us and played Horrified American Monsters version. But we had planned a day from BGGCon. We said, hey, let's get together. You know, we live in the same city. Why have we not played games before? And we went to their house, got to see their beautiful home. Lainey cooked us an amazing dinner. Oh, my God. The curry was delightful. It was really, really good. Uh, and I always like it's one of those things where it's just so kind of someone to go out of their way to prepare a portion of the dinner or all the dinner, whatever, vegan, because it's extra steps. It's extra care. It's extra caution. It's extra ingredients. So I really appreciated that. Uh, we brought some beers and cookies, and we went to see their awesome game room and all their games, and we just sat and chatted, played games, hung out, uh, and I felt like we really got to know them better. And you know, I, it's not just yeah. now people we've met in passing. We've now actually got to sit and visit and have beer, and it was really nice. And I really connected with Lainey on a molecular level whenever she's going through, just standing in John's game room and says, well, that's a new game. Well, that one's new. And he was like, oh, my God. I said, how are you finding these? I you... just got that in the house today. He was trying to be sneaky, but she knows. So I really connected with her there. She's literally just standing there and goes, wait a minute. When did you get Jaws of a Lion, the Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion? And he was like, what are you, what are you talking about? It's been here. She's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> See, Lainey works for BGG. She's been to every BGG con except for the first one yep. because her son was born. Yep. Or she was about to have her son or something like that. Yeah, I believe she said she was like pretty much in labor the week of. Yeah, so yes, she has been to every single BGG con except for that one. She works for BGG, so she knows all the games. She knows all the cons. She knows everything. And John's right there along with her. And so we hope to have them on the podcast soon to talk about their BGG experience, like what it's like behind the scenes. What are some cool con stories? Because I know that we've heard a lot. Ones we will not also repeat on here. We'll let them choose which they would like to share <laughs> with the public. But it was such a fun time last night. We we stayed up till after midnight playing games. We did, which is, you know, not common for us. We're normally like, oh, 1030 bedtime night. But it was so much fun. Lainey and John were so kind and hospitable, and their kids were funny, too. We got to have dinner with them. So thank you guys for having us over and for a wonderful game night, and we cannot wait for the next one. Oh, definitely. I'm ready to play more games now. We have more game friends. That's what we need. But speaking of games being played, let's go to the game of the episode. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's, it's a game. So the game for this episode is one I picked up at the BGG Con Bazaar this year. This is Minerva from Pandasaurus Games. Minerva is designed by Hisashi Hayashi, graphic design by Franz Volwinkel, rulebook writer says HAL99, English rulebook writer is Zimion, rulebook proofreader Mandy Tong, and rulebook editor W. Eric Martin. Minerva is a game where you are playing... I believe like a Roman leader. So here's the thing with this game. It's got a theme that I like, right? It's like Minerva. You're like, okay, sweet. It's the, the Roman version of Athena, basically. Let's, you know, cool gods. And you're like, ah, cool. It's a city building thing. But really the theme on this is not necessary, right? The theme's kind of pasted on. So if I mess up something, it's going to sound, uh, might sound weird, but it's not bad. This says, let me see, Roman Empire, an empire so large, powerful that the, its fame is still known today. Uh, each player is an official in charge of one of the Roman cities, all of which aim to become a prosperous and important as Rome, the glorious capital. Only the player who develops the best city will earn the favor of the goddess Minerva and win the game. So we are running a city. The way the game is going to work is you are putting tiles onto your tableau. So it is a tile laying game. You start with your fountain tile, which would be the fountain in the middle of your city and you will add tiles around that as long as they are touching another one completely. So if you're, you know, you can put it on the, the up, down, left, right directions, the orthogonal directions. You can buy tiles to place there. You can place residence tiles, which will activate the ones you've played. You can place assistance if you have them, or you can pass your turn. Those are your options. So the way the game is essentially going to flow is you will use your resources, which are wheat, wood, stone, Oh, I can't think if it's like an if it's a crystal or it's iron. A jewel. I think it's actually iron, but it looks like it's like a diamond. We yeah. keep calling it a jewel. <laughs> but those are the resources. There are money, 
Uh, so basically, you'll get a tile if it they have a cost if you have to buy pay for them or not. You'll put it in your tableau. If you pay it, you pay it with resources, or you can pay three coins for a single resource. Uh, you know to make sure you can do that. If you need money, you can always trade a single resource in for one money, which is awesome. But you'll place them down in your tableau. Then when you need to collect more resources, you can take one of your residence buildings and place it anywhere in your city and then activate all of the tiles in a straight line in one direction. So, for example, let's say you have so far, it's the beginning of the game, and you've taken your first starting tile, your fountain, you've played two tiles to the right of it. One of them gives you the wheat icon, wheat resource. One of them gives you wood. You want to activate those to get something. You can put a residence on the far right of those. So you have now a a string of four tiles. On the far right is the residence. You will then activate every tile in a direction of your choice. In that case, you would say left of that residence. You would then gain the resources on the tiles to the left of the residence until you hit the end of your city or another residence tile. But is that how we played it the first time, Delton? No, not at all. I totally missed a rule and Haley trounced me. Well, here's the thing. In my defense, I asked twice if this is how the game was played. And he said yes. And so I milked the shit out of it. Well, you did. I also kept looking for the rule and couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I finally found it toward the end of the game. And I was like, oh, okay. So basically, how the game is supposed to be played is you have your resources all in a line, either in the orthogonal directions. And if you're wanting to activate a line, you, you put a building there. And so basically, if you have buildings capped on each end, like you can't activate those resources anymore in Correct. that line. So, but we didn't really find that. We just saw that, okay, you can, whenever you activate a line, you just put another building on. Like we didn't see that if you were to activate a, a line, that it stops at the next building. So I was just act. I made my row like it was a straight twenty two tiles long. I put like a couple on top just to score some bonus points. But my row was ridiculous, and every single time I activated it, I just got all the resources. And I think the final score is what one. It was like one hundred eight to thirty six or something. Yeah. So it I was won. Bad. <laughs> I won. By a long shot, and Delton was stacking his like you're probably supposed to, but... I was trying to play more of the, like, toward the actual, like, the way that it wants you to score, and you were going that way, and I was like, okay, this isn't good, but... I'm a boundary pusher, man. I guess so. It was legal, as far as I knew, But we fixed that rule for the play tonight. And I still won. She only won by the tiebreaker, I'm gonna point that out. It was a very close game, which was good. And we went and took different approaches to it, which I think is very good. Um, but the game's really interesting because there's the resource tiles that you play, but when you activate, you get a resource. There's the special tiles that the moment you put them down, they do something and then they're done for the rest of the game. Then there's the temples, which are their own little set you can buy from. They all cost the same cost. And when you purchase one, it has an end of game scoring condition. And there's a whole stack. Different ones will come out every game. Uh, but I really liked that. So, uh, there's one more thing you can do. I guess I should say say two. There are cultural tiles. Basically, some of the resource tokens have like a point in arts or a point in scholarly stuff, whatever it's called, and or theater. And what happens is when you activate those, you get a tile from the top of a little stack, a little token. Uh, That stack starts off with value two and goes two, three, four, five, seven. And so if you're able to get to the bottom and activate and have enough during an activation to get that bottom tile, you know, you just, you get points that way. The uh, temples are going to be end of game. And then there are, uh, uh, not honor, glory tokens. So basically you can get these glory pieces during the game based on activation. Um, Once you get those glory tokens at the end, after people hire assistance, if they want, those glory tokens allow you to basically say, I have the most glory. I'm taking the most points for the turn second place most glory gets the second place most, and then third and fourth and so on, depending on how many players, which I guess the game goes up to four. Uh, Those are all the ways you get points, so there's a lot of ways to get points, a lot of ways to focus your energy in the game, which I do really appreciate that. Uh, The other thing I really like so far, is as Haley said, if you put a residence on the right end of your string of stuff, and then you do it again on the left to activate later, you're never going to be able to activate that line altogether again unless you play an assistant on one of those residences and that assistant will allow you to then activate that row again. So in the entirety of the whole game, the game runs for six rounds and that is a static 
never changing six rounds, no matter how many players, it's six rounds. You will only place, at most, your nine residences. And you can only place, at most, I guess that's five assistants. Yes. So you can only have, at a, a cap, at 14 activations during the game of your tiles. So getting resources and having these activations planned out, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of planning. But even so, the game is rated for an hour to an hour and a half, and Delton and I played the last one in 37 minutes. It was like 37, almost 38 minutes is all. And that was a yeah. full game. That was a full game. Now, we had we had known the rules because, again, yes. we had played it before and had the rules wrong, so we reread the rules. But, yeah, start to finish, 37 minutes is all it took. I could see a four-player game going longer over an hour, but uh, I think if everyone knows the rules really, really well, I bet you could do it in an hour, maybe an hour 10. Which is really good. I like when a game plays faster than the time on the box. It's not often. Yes. And like Delton said, too, uh, so we ended up tying it. We, we uh, settled the game by tiebreaker, but we had very different uh, plans for the game. We had very different strategies. So me, I went ham on cultural yeah. and on glory. So I tried to go for the glory points. Whoever had the most glory every round. Got points over the second most, got fewer points, but I went hardcore for those two. What was your strategy, Delt? I wanted to set up for temples. And the temples I liked because I had a temple that said in straight in the straight up, down, left, right directions from this temple, you get two points for every different type of building. Like if you get a single green type of building, that counts as two points. If you also happen to have an orange building, that's two points. So I got the max of 14, and then I had another temple. That was how many orange buildings in a straight line up, down, left, right from it. And I ended up having four, which gave me another 12 points. So I was going for those more end game scoring where you place it in a good spot and you try to build to it. Or you try to set your city up to where it's going to benefit from it. And I felt like I did a pretty good job about it. I mean, the fact we tied was good. And the fact that we both had like over 50 points, I think was good. On the back of the rule book, uh, there is actually a solitaire version of the game. And it says you set it up as a two-player game. Uh, it says to aim uh, to start, aim to try to score forty points. So that's like it's that's doing good if it's uh, your first shot at it. So I feel like as a two-player game, that's good for us. Like having we both had fifty-eight, so we're almost at sixty points. We had a, a a pretty good run there. But it was neat having different strategies, getting such so close in points that it came to the tiebreaker. And then of course you nab the tiebreaker because your strategy is what the tiebreaker goes off of, which is your combination of glory and cultural tiles. Which, in, you know, Delton was talking about the solo. I can see where this would be a really good solo game. Just a neat puzzle? Yeah, because it's basically just a multiplayer solitaire. The only interaction we have is if you take the tiles that I want or vice versa. Basically, it's if I take the tiles you want, buy the things you want, We if we fight for glory at all. And I guess that is really it, and that's not really very strong interaction. So the only interaction really that's if you take if I take something that you wanted, which is fine. That's not my favorite kind of interaction for sure, but it's not too bad in this game. We should get bonus points for who is the most Roman because basically I stole all of the culture and built up my military and that's what got me to win. I mean, accurate. Yeah, basically. But it's a really neat game. I wasn't knowing what to expect. I had seen it before. I think I remember when this was I think this was on Kickstarter at some point. I could be wrong there. But I remember when it came out, looking at it, going, I like to look at the cover. I like to look at the tiles. Uh, you know, they're pretty neat. I would like to play it. And I found it for a good price in the bazaar. You mean I haggled for it? You haggled for a better price in the bazaar. I am the best haggler in the world. Every game we bought, I haggled for. And I did good. I mean, that's true. But it's one I wanted to try. And so far, I've liked it. It's a neat game. And what I think is interesting is for as much that the game has going on, which really isn't that much, it surprisingly would be an easy teach, which I like. As long as you are teaching that you Correctly. only collect as many resources as up to the next building you've placed. I don't know if that made any sense. This is why Delton teaches the rules and explains the game. This is one of those games that's hard to explain through audio because you're like, you're placing a tile and you put this one to the left and if you put this one to the right, then the one that goes on the right of that, and it's like, okay, hold on, wait, how many directions? Well, I also think it's just me too because remember that one time that I taught you how to play a game, Cave versus Cave? Yeah, it was rough. It was like an hour and a half of me trying to relay what I just read to him in the rule book and then about 37 minutes of play. So I will point out, part of the reason that I wanted to try this game is that uh, it was designed by Hisashi Hayashi 
He's a Japanese board game designer. Um, his probably, it looks like most popular game is Yokohama. It's a TMG game, which, you know, TMG has sadly shut down. Uh, all of their Yokohama Deluxe Editions have sold out on cool stuff, so I was not able to grab one. Um, they also have a Yokohama, the du- like a dual version, so at some point I'll get my hands on it. But he's the designer of Yokohama, of the deck building game Trains, which we enjoy. He also designed Metro X, a roll and write that I really like, along with like 58, 59 other different games that a lot of them I don't know. Goat and Goat looks adorable. He designed Issa Rebe. It's a fishing game from 2014 I've always wanted to play. So he's designed a lot of games that I've either seen or have played or have wanted to play. And so he's one of those designers. When I see his name, I'm going to try it. So, yeah. But yeah, so that is Minerva from Pandasaurus Games. It's definitely worth checking out. You know what else is worth checking out? Beer. Beer. I finished Delton's beer for him because I am a good wife. This one's just not my favorite. I just don't care for spicy in drinks. That's, you know, that's a personal taste. I just love spicy in everything. Literally everything. That's true. So this next beer is from Tup's Brewery. It might sound familiar. In October, we had from Tup's Full Grown Jack. This is Full Grown Nick, an imperial stout with holiday spices. Actually, I think that was last episode. I think that was November. Uh, maybe it was. Either way, we had it. Uh, this is a 12.1% alcohol by volume, loaded with everything spice and everything nice. Get your share before Nick gets his. Do not drink and slay. SRM, whatever that stands for, is 50. IBU of 50, which means it won't be very hoppy at all. 5 out of 5 on body, 5 out of 5 on roast, 5 out of 5 on color, 2 out of 5 on bitter, and 3 out of 5 on sweet. But I always slay. Does that but mean I can't, can't drink this? You can't drink and slay. Slay. Yeah, My like fashion. E-I-G-H, not the way you're saying it. Oh. Yeah, like a sleigh, like the, the reindeer pull it. Well, I am really excited for this. As you all know, Tups is one of my favorite breweries of all time. So I am hashtag stoked for this here beer. Beer me up, Scotty. In the words of Andy from The Office, beer me. And I do not mean a CD. So this beer also is dark Mm. as night, not letting anything through. Uh, It holds a head much better than the last one. Oh my God, it smells like Christmas. It smells like, I can, it feels like there's ginger. A lot of cinnamon. It smells like... Cinnamon for sure. It smells like my gingerbread cookies I just pulled out of the oven. It's got that sweet... So this is a very Christmassy smell. Ooh. By the way, I just made gingerbread cookies before this episode, and they are good. They are spicy. This is much more carbonation. It tastes like a gingerbread. This is a gingerbread cookie as beer. Wow, that is the most gingerbread cookie beer I have ever had. That is delicious. It's not overly sweet, surprisingly, but it is sweeter than I expected. Well, it's kind of like what you want in a gingerbread. You know, gingerbread, so I just made gingerbread so I know this. Yep. There's only half a cup of sugar in my gingerbread recipe. There's a half a cup of molasses, so you have sweetness from that too, but you have a whole bunch of spices. So it is a, it is a sweet, it is a cookie, it's still a dessert, but what you're getting in a gingerbread is the ginger, it's the cloves, it's the allspice. This is what you get in this beer as well. You get this taste of ginger, of the cinnamon, of the cloves. And then you have a little sweetness underneath. This is a gingerbread cookie and a beer. It is delightful. It's really 100% good. 100% recommend. Merry Christmas to us. Tups just does so well. There is it's not, a really good beer. There has not been a single thing by Tups that I have disliked. It is That's true. all wonderful. That's a really good beer. But yes, that is a Full Grown Nick from Tups Brewery out of Texas. Uh, try to find that if you enjoy a gingerbread beer. With that being said, let's move to the topic. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So as we stated in the game part of the episode, uh, we were playing Minerva incorrectly the first time we played it. Very, very incorrectly. And partway through that incorrect play, Haley made a comment saying that either we've got something wrong or this game is broken. I think is what you put like some way basically that yes. right yeah uh, that's a that's a what's the term where you take somebody's stuff and you shorten it and kind of uh, paraphrase that was like yes. a paraphrasing of your comment so the topic today we wanted uh, I wanted to call it gaming confidence this is Haley's idea for a topic so Haley I want you to take the lead so basically you know at what point as a gamer do you have the confidence to say 
this is a game that I don't like because I don't like it versus this is a bad game. So I, I told when I was pitching this idea to Delton, I mean, it's not like this is a newsroom and he's the editor, but still, I was pitching this to him as a possible topic. And we've, dis- we've discussed it with John and Lainey, too, and I'll bring up some of their points as well. But, you know, for me, whenever Delton brought me into the hobby, you know, I was 20 years old. And, of course, 20-year-olds know everything, right? 100%. 100%. And so, you know, looking back at 20-year-old Haley, I was smart and I knew it, and I was confident in my abilities, and I had played a crap ton of Monopoly in my day and apples to apples. I was a gamer, by God. And not that those aren't gamer games. Like, they, you can be a gamer and like those games, but that was really all that I knew in gaming. And so Delton sat me down and taught me, I think it was uh, Mansions of Madness. And at first, I didn't like it. I did not like the game. It was a bad game. And I didn't tell this to Delton. You no, know, one, because we just started dating. I didn't want to hurt his feelings. But two... I wanted to seem smart. And like looking back, so there's this uh, concept in psychology called the frustration aggression hypothesis. So basically, whenever you get frustrated with something, it makes your defenses go up. You get maybe get angry and we get irritated, but it also makes your self-esteem drop. It makes it go hella down. So again, you get frustrated, aggression goes up or irritability and your self-esteem goes down. And looking back, I can definitely see that happening. Like he sat down to teach me this game. It was completely outside of my wheelhouse. And initially, whenever I started to realize I, I don't get it or this is more than you know what I've taken on before in a board game, then that's exactly what happened. And, and immediately, I, I didn't like the game. And so, you know, looking back, I can see, you know, that was just me getting angry. That was me having low self-esteem and projecting it onto the game that I didn't like. It was a bad game. It was a bad game. I didn't want to play it anymore. Um, and now, you know, I'd, I'd play it. But, you know, the more that I am playing games, I think, you know, one, I overcame that initial, I don't understand this. Like, now if I sit down and play a game or really anything and I don't get it at first, I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> Explain again. I feel like I have, ironically, the confidence that's high enough to say, I don't get this. I feel dumb. Help me. Um, but two, you know, I feel like I've been in the hobby long enough and I played freaking probably 800 to a thousand games by this point i feel like i've played enough games to be able to say objectively whether a game is bad or not and so what we i kind of wanted to talk about today was you know one how do you build that confidence and two how do you use that confidence as well because when we were talking to um john and laney last night john had a good point where he said you know when it comes to being able to you know say if a game is bad or not you have to have the experience to back it up like, you can't just say, I don't like it, and that way it's bad. You have to have a reason why don't you like it. Was it, what mechanic was it, what theme was it, so on and so forth. And so I thought I'd open the floor for Delta to kind of talk about your experience, then we can talk about, you know, what that might look like for somebody. It's a tough space to be because I do agree that you you have to have that experience to be able to officially and objectively call a game bad and understand when it is or not. Um, and I do think it takes a, a level of confidence within yourself of your own abilities. Because there are a lot of times with me playing games that there's just games I do not get. Still to this day, a lot of them end up being trick-taking games. They're, or a game with some rule. Like Sometimes certain games just do not click with me. There's one in particular uh, that I always think about, which is we've talked about before on the podcast in the past, but Alan has his game Dragon's Head. I still don't understand. I don't know why you want to make certain decisions in that game. I understand how trick-taking games work now, which I still, I, I don't know why they work, why they do. I just get it. Um, but I, I, that game, I don't know why decisions are made. I don't know the benefit. I don't know the bad part. And none of it is clicking. And I felt like every time we've played it, everyone around me understands. It just doesn't make sense. That's something that just doesn't click with me. It's not that the game is bad because we all have fun playing it. But it's just that I don't understand. So I can't objectively say that his game is bad because it's not. I think that I can, rec- I can notice this is good. I'm just not getting it, right? I have enough confidence in my own ability and my lack of ability that I know when my brain is just not cooperating. But then I also know when a game just isn't very fun, which I feel like, and you know, I don't want to just crap on games. And I'm trying to think of any games I know of off the top of my head that I'm just like, this game is objectively bad and I can't really think of any, but that's possibly because 
I play them once. If something like that is obvious, we just don't play it again. I like Siberia. That Outpost Siberia game from IDW or whatever. Yeah, that wasn't great at all. I feel bad. I It was five bucks on the clearance table at uh, Barnes & Noble, and there's probably a reason there was like eight copies there. Want, want, but... Uh, I do agree with that. And like you said, with John and Laney's points, they were talking about, you know, sometimes it's just the group you're playing with. It's not that the game is necessarily a bad game, but sometimes for your group, it is. Maybe it makes like for a bad experience. Exactly. And you don't want a bad experience with certain people. And sometimes it's better just with other, another group. And so like, I I think for my own confidence, so my, like a a graph of my confidence, if the, you know, Y axis as it rises, then you know, that's more confidence in saying a game is bad. It's like the letter M. Initially, when I started playing board games, I had really high confidence in saying a game was bad, even though I really didn't have the expertise to say so. And then it like went down for years where a game might have been bad and I might have thought so, but I didn't feel confident enough to say it was bad because I don't feel like I, I knew enough. And that's subjective. That's my own experience. I can't I can't bestow upon someone if they know enough about games to say something's bad or not. Because if you've been playing games for three months versus 30 years, you, you can probably say if a game is bad or not. But then my confidence started going up. And the reason why I brought this up is because when we were playing Minerva, I thought this must have been a bad game. Either we are playing something wrong or this is a bad game because this is broken as shit. And so, I don't know. For me, I... I feel like I'm just now getting to a point where I feel confident enough as a gamer to be able to be objective in what's good or bad. Like, whenever we played uh, um, Tyler's prototype, like, I finally felt some confidence in being able to give feedback. I don't really feel like I've ever felt that way before until about this year. And that makes sense. It's really tough. And uh, that's something I find myself that I, you know, as, as many games as I've played and as much as I've looked into this and that, I don't have, I play games to have fun. If a game is bad, A, I'm likely not trying to play a bad game. Like, I'm not going to go out of my way if everyone says this game's terrible. I'm probably not going to put any effort into trying it. I'm just going to ignore it and go to something people say is good or that I've had my eye on. But uh, for games, like for me to objectively call a game bad, the problem is I go into a game trying to be positive and trying to have a fun time and finding something that's negative about it. Like I can always point out something in a game of like, well, I didn't like this one thing, not saying it's bad. I just didn't like that. But to say a game is truly bad is when you, to me, you have to discover something is broken. Right. And I I find with myself, I have a hard time pinpointing those things that like, this doesn't work at all. This needs to be reworked uh, on a specific type, you know, and on a, the, I guess you'd call it a micro or macro I don't know which level. Micro level, very small. I know, but my macro photography takes pictures of small things, so I don't know how those words work. Anyway, if it's a very specific instance, like, well, I don't like these because of this, there's very few times that I have issues with that. And I have a hard time pointing those things out because I'm trying to have a good time and have a good experience and not hit a point halfway through the first game that we've tried and say, ah, this game isn't good. It's just not worth my time. Because then it's like, okay, well, what am I doing here? I'm trying to play this game and have fun. After the game is over, we can say, well, I'm not sure about this. I would like to try it again to see if it's any good. I don't think I've played a game that I've just came away and gone, that was a horrible game. It's a shit mechanic. It's not that I didn't have fun. It's that the game is bad. I don't think I've ever felt that. But I think part of it is I go into games with a positive outlook of, I want to play this to try to have fun. So I don't know. I also think I do not have a game designer brain. I think that's part of it. Oh, why do you say that? It's just one of those things where uh, you sit down with anyone who's a game designer. I mean, we sat down with, you know, Alan and Isaac. We play games with Alan. We play games with Isaac. And the different things they point out that I'm like, uh, I, uh, what? What are you talking about? I don't, I don't understand how you spot. What are you talking about? Like, don't, uh, and then it makes sense when they say it. But until they say it, you're like, I don't, I didn't see that at all. That's how I feel. But I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I just have a hard time. I have a hard time pointing out things that are broken in a game to where I can truly actively say it's a bad game. Sometimes it's glaringly obvious. Other times I'm probably going to miss it until you point it out. That's just me and my brain. That makes sense. Well, I think we should kind of like tie up this topic with like a nice bow and talk about, you know, what are, if you do feel like a game is bad, like how do you, how do you one, separate that from your feelings? And two, you know, apply that to different situations. There's different definitions of bad. 
And so, you know, I think for me and like separating it from my feelings is um, kind of what John said. You know, what is something that I can point out is is bad? Like, is it bad because I lost? Because I didn't like it? Because I feel like it's unfair? Because Delta got more resources than me? Or is it bad because, you know, one mechanic seems broken and it's broken for everybody? In a way, what about for you? If you were to say, like, the game is bad, what do you feel like that would be for you? Because, like, with Splendor, like, you don't like Splendor. We don't necessarily think that it's a bad game. I don't think Splendor is a bad game. I think Splendor presents itself as one thing that it's actually not. I think that's my problem with it. So I don't think that it's the the game. I guess I could use Splendor as the example. Splendor's not a bad game. The way the game functions and plays is not bad. To me, the thing that ruins Splendor is that it's a game that you don't play the way it presents itself and you will win. If you try to get the Royals at the top of the board, you're never going to win that game against someone who knows to just buy cards with point values. That's it. I've never seen a person who's gone for the Royals win. And I've probably played it four or five times, maybe six times. And I know that that's a very small number. And I'm sure someone out there is like, I can do it every time getting at least one Royal. Good for you. I've never you, got a Royal and I've been undefeated in that game. Yes, every time Haley's played the game, she's never got a Royal and she's won. And every other person that's ever played that I've seen has won that way. So for me, it's not that the game is bad. The mechanics aren't bad. The way it plays isn't bad. It's the fact that it says, hey, here's the top of the mountain. This is where you're supposed to go. But you don't have to to win. And I think that's the thing that discourages me. And honestly, this makes me think of, uh, this makes me tie in a little and think of, uh, that was Alan's thing. Uh, his dislike when we played the Dale of Merchants, like collector's box game. We weren't able to play the actual core set. But his thing that he didn't like was the game had all the cards in the sets had different abilities on them. He never once used a single ability and was still able to keep up and contend with everyone else. So the game presented itself as, look at all these abilities you can do and all this interaction and all this stuff. But in the end, that didn't matter. We were all one turn away from winning when you won. And I can see his point on that. But that's also one of those styles of games being a deck builder where it's like, I like that a game can and you can and you can also not use the abilities and still function and play the game. The abilities can be used in a way that can benefit you faster or get to that score more quickly. It just depends. So I feel like my view of Splendor is kind of like Alan's view on Dale of Merchants, where it's like it presents itself as this, but it's not necessarily that that's the case, and that's why I dislike it. However, I enjoy Dale of Merchants, where I don't enjoy Splendor. I think that's a perfect segue into the second half. You know, being able to confidently say this game is bad or I don't like this game or I don't get this game. Like all of those are equally valid. I feel like a 20-year-old Haley might have said this game is bad when what she really meant is I don't like this game or I'm not good at this game or I don't get this game. And I feel like all of those are equally valid. But, you know, whenever we we talk about criticizing games or being open to try games, I feel like that's something that we need to, me, I need to and had to learn how to and probably still learning how to, how to say, I don't like this game rather than it's a bad game or I don't get this game rather than it's a bad game and normalizing that that's okay too. You don't have to like every game. You don't have to get every game either. It's like Delton says, it doesn't get trick-taking games, and that's okay. There are games that I just do not understand, like Dominant Species. I, I love it. I, I don't get it. I, I have not won that game. I've not gotten close to winning that game. I've listened to the rules countless times from Delty. I don't get that game. And so, and that's okay. I don't freaking get it. doesn't mean it's a bad game. I don't freaking get it. <laughs> exactly. It makes sense. But, I mean, within that, there's always going to be some game that you dislike. And now, join us for a Malt House Games Podcast special, My Size Question. So for the question of this episode, to give everything a nice little bow tie and wrap, what game do you dislike? And why? I'm going to add that caveat, or not caveat, extension, the extra, just, you know, yeah. Elaboration. There you go. I dislike Level 99's Millennium Blades. Aw. I tried... And there are very few games that we're like partway through and I'm like, I don't want to play anymore. I can't do this. But Millennium Blade was one. Like we got to like the end of a round or something. We had cracked the metaphorical packs or whatever. 
They're supposed to represent. I looked at Delton and I said, I am not having fun. I do not like this game. Now, that game, I know it's popular. I know people love it. I know that Delton was at a mad dash to get it at Gen Con 2018 or whenever it was we went. 2017. 2017. Oh, my God. But I just did not like it. And I sat there and I tried to have a positive attitude. And I feel like I had a positive attitude throughout. But I was just not having fun. I didn't like it. The game didn't click. It is not my kind of game. Doesn't mean it's a bad game. I don't like the game. And that's completely fair. What about you, Delty Poo? I mean, I always talk about Splendor being the game I dislike the most. Um, okay, I got a, I got one here. And it's actually one we still have on our shelves because you won't let me get rid of it. Uh, Smash em Up. Or Smash Up. Smash em Up. <laughs> uh, Smash Up from, shoot, who makes Smash Up? AEG. I actually have an expansion in there we've never opened to play. Because you won't play it with me. So Smash Up's a game I don't really care for. I like the idea of, hey, you decide what you want. Do you want zombie dinosaurs? You got it. Do you want princess kitties which is the expansion you got it like do you want uh uh trickster aliens you got it like you get to make these weird little combination decks and you play but you have this awesome idea of how the cards play and then it just kind of comes down to math and for me that's anticlimactic i think every the, the couple times we've played it's like this is neat you know this is kind of cool uh, yeah, this is interesting, and it just slowly fades, and then the game's gone on for an hour and a half, and you're like, all right, uh, is there 15 here yet? No. Okay, I'm going to play this, and uh, oh, you made this creature leave, and now math, how many is there again? And then you have to re-math, and for me, that just, it brings down, the game looks like it would be Flash, you know, Flash, boom, bang, onomatopoeia city, everything goes so <laughs> fast, and it's nice and fun, and these cool decks. And it just comes down to doing math. And I just don't really enjoy it. Like, I'll play it if, I, if like, a group wanted to. But it's not something that I'm going to actively seek out. It just doesn't doesn't hit. Like, when I play a card game, I just don't, I don't want to do nothing but math the whole time. And that's fair. Yeah. I really like it because it's quirky. It's cute. I don't have to think a lot to play. I can play it with my, you that's know. That's because you're good at mental math, damn it. Well, I mean, that's true. Me and like 13-year-olds can do like basic mental math. And so that's why it connects so well with my nephew when we play it. That's true. But that's fair. It's fair why you don't like it. And again, that doesn't mean it's bad games. I mean, maybe it is bad game. Smash Up's very popular. It's very it's, popular. It's one of those games that you can't really say is bad. It's just that there's a specific audience. It's the same with Munchkin. Not, yeah. a, fa- not a fan of Munchkin. Same. But Munchkin's popular. It's an easy to get into game. You can play it. You can do it to screw your friends over or any kind of like that. That's just not the kind of game we play. Yeah. And so I think, again, it's normalizing. I don't like a game. I don't get a game. And also, my game's bad. It's okay. And again, if it, we are not the uh, board games are bad police. We cannot tell you if you have enough experience to say a board game is bad. I think it's just, it, it's, it depends on the person, depends on the group. Yep. And that's okay. Exactly. So, yes, I think that that uh, wraps up the question there pretty nicely. Uh, I'm going to give a good a big shout out to our Patreon patrons that we have. Uh, that's a big thank you to Allison, Alan, Jesse, Catherine, Jennifer, and Cliff. I'm going to go ahead and give another shout out to Tyler because we played Mario Golf, me, him, and Alan, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And a big shout out to John, who's backing us on there uh, because it was fun to go play at John and Laney's house and play games. And thank you for the curry recipe. Oh, yes, and a curry recipe that we'll be able to make. Uh, yeah, so make sure to follow us on social media at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can send an email to contact at malthousegames.com, and that's for if you have any games you think we need to take a look at, any topics you want us to cover, a question you want us to answer on the show, or if there's a beer that you like and we can get, tell us, and we will go find it and we'll talk about it on an episode. You can make sure and go to social media to find me at Delton Brack, D-E-L-T-O-N-B-R-A-C-K. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. Uh, Make sure to go to shop.malthousegames.com if you want to grab a t-shirt with our logo or a sticker, a fanny pack, or a beer glass on there. Make sure to go to our website in general, even though it loads very slowly lately. Uh, You can look at all the content that we have made thus far on the podcast. I think that that is going to wrap this episode up. So thank you again for tuning in and listening to the Malthouse Games podcast, episode number 107. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye.